This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and today's video will be an update on what happened with Shrapnel Mine since my last video covering this new robot way back in July. Whoops, uh, been a while. I'll also talk about the progress that I've made to solve some new issues that came to light recently. Shrapnel Mine, where we left off. When I last showed Shrapnel Mine, I was testing a diamond saw and found that, surprisingly, it sucked at cutting things, especially aluminum. I'd been using just a 3D printed carbon fiber nylon chassis up to that point with literally nowhere for the electronics to go, so they were taped behind it. I know this video is already going to be pretty scatterbrained because I did and filmed a lot of things yesterday and before BattleBots made a ton of changes that I have basically no footage of, so here's a super quick rundown. Right after that failed diamond saw test, I ordered a few new saw blade designs from Send Cut Send, one being this blade you see on the bot now. This six-tooth saw blade design was an attempt to get the best possible cutting performance in plastics, and also maybe something approaching an impact weapon without the weight to try a true single-tooth saw blaze style weapon. I didn't want to try an impact weapon because I have no faith in the motor bearings taking serious hits, nor the arm and servo mechanism, and I also don't have much weight to dedicate to a weapon for it to really work as a kinetic energy weapon. Some initial testing showed that the six-tooth design was promising. Now, with the motivation of knowing that all my hard work wouldn't be completely useless, I finally designed the rest of the robot. Yep, that's right, we're skipping over all of the CAD this time. If you want a more detailed design overview video going over the CAD, let me know in the comments. And be sure to subscribe and hit the bell while you're at it so you don't miss that video either. Before getting totally swamped with other things to do for BattleBots, I got a huge send cut send order, including the aluminum links, AR500 forks, and titanium base plates. I spent all week printing iterations and parts of spares to throw the robot together, thinking I might be able to bring it to a competition, but making BattleBots parts took precedent, and the bot sat untouched for like two months until this past Friday. This video is going to be all over the place because I tried to pick up where I left off without realizing that I had already changed so much you haven't seen yet by adding all those metal parts. Possibly the first bizarre design decision you'll notice is that the base plate is not at all flat. In fact, it's a 16th inch thick titanium base plate that I bent by hand the only way I know how, clamping it to the edge of a table, blasting it with a blowtorch, and hitting it very hard over and over with a big hammer. I'm as surprised as you are that they're fairly consistent. The reason the base plate is bent is so when the arm is fully extended, the main body is flat to the floor, and the servo arm doesn't need to travel more than 180 degrees. Plus, it allows me to package the battery underneath the robot, because there's no room anywhere on top where the saw couldn't chop it in half. After spending a few hours bending the base plates, I deburred and tapped all the metal parts as needed. Then, I assembled the robot to- wait, what the fu- I assembled the robot to make sure it was under 3 pounds. At this point, it was August 1st, with just 20 days to go before BattleBots Season 6 filming, and I had tons to do to help Retrograde and Bloodsport get ready. All work on Travel Mine was halted, until now. New problems. Friday night after work, I picked up the bot again for the first time to try and make some progress. I wanted to make a list of all the issues that still needed to be addressed before it was fight ready. When I tried driving it around my apartment, which I forgot to film, it was extremely jittery and uncontrollable. The steel sharp forks were digging into every seam of my apartment's vinyl floor. In addition to that, the drive motors seemed to be on the edge of stalling all the time, and the drive speed controllers were getting super hot to the point the insulation started to melt off. This wasn't gonna work. My first priority was to fix the drive. In total, the list of issues I have now that need to be solved, from highest to lowest priority, is something like this. Number one, the drivetrain needs to be way better. Number two, there's no way to turn the robot on if the top armor is added. Number three, all the electronics need to be cleaned up and constrained. Number four, I need to figure out where all the ESCs can live and adjust their wire lengths to fit. Number five, the servo mount is pretty weak and needs to be improved. Number six, hardware on the linkage system loosens up over time. Number seven, I need a final armor package designed and printed to properly enclose everything. Number eight, I need to choose materials for the final versions of all the printed components. Number nine, I need an alternative configuration for fighting horizontal spinners or any other weird bot. Today's video is just going to tackle the first couple of those items, starting with the drivetrain. I wasn't able to attend the September Norwalk Havoc event this year, but I was watching the stream, and I noticed that this one robot, Diamondback, had a very good drive system. This was built by Cory, and I've talked with him a bit about some of his other designs. His robot uses pretty cheap standard rushless motor from basically anywhere, that is about 1000 kV, but 
he is gearing it down seven to one with some servo city gears a nine tooth pinion and a 64 tooth spur gear on the wheel he's using 2.75 inch diameter bot kits stock wheels on shrapnel mine i'm using custom wheels that are 1.9 inches in diameter and my motor shaft is bigger than the one that he's using since it has a five millimeter shaft but still i realized that i could probably do something similar Servo City doesn't sell any 5mm bore gears except for a 15 tooth pinion, but I was able to find on Amazon some 11 tooth RC car racing pinions, so I ordered a couple of those. In the meantime, I realized I can just 3D print some plastic gears and glue them on with hot glue to be able to test this idea out. So that's exactly what I did. Fusion 360 has a built-in spur gear generator, so it only took a couple minutes to model up an 11 tooth pinion gear and a 54 tooth sprocket that I could put on the wheel. The printer right now is working on the next of these spur gears, so this is what I had before. This is what I'm going to try now. This is an 11 tooth spur gear or pinion gear here. Um, I ordered some from Amazon that I'm waiting on that are steel and have a set screw to hold onto the shaft. This is temporarily hot glued in place, but I don't really trust that as a final drive method, so I think that a set screwed steel gear will be fine, and because it's so small, it weighs nothing. So 11 tooth pinion and a 54 tooth uh, gear here. So yeah, be more than a four to one, presumably that I can get now. And I think that might be good enough to make this actually work, but there's only one way to find out. Right now I'm printing these in PLA. I tried PETG and uh, for some reason I was having some bit of heat issues so I just switched to PLA because I'm lazy and I wanted to work quickly. Um, but final version, I will most likely try and print uh, this gear in nylon and this one, like I said, will be steel. All right, so the bot right now is very underweight. So I've got plenty of weight to add armor and stuff. I've also got this, which is about a bit over 13 pounds. Looks like we're at 3,831 RPM. Electrical cleanup. I'm showing this a bit out of order, so you might have already seen what I did here to clean up the wiring a bit. I'm definitely by no means finished packaging the electronics, but I think I came up with a good way to locate and mount both my Just Cause PCB switch and Just Cause basic PD board in the bot. It involves some kind of sketchy soldering work to do it, but there's no reason it shouldn't work. I'd originally intended to use the FingerTech switch on my basic board, but it would have been in a really awkward position and really difficult to actually access the switch. So I decided to remove the FingerTech switch and use one of my Just Cause PCB switches instead. The Just Cause PCB switch is designed to sit flush against a panel, and that way I could mount it directly to the 3D printed side armor on the bot with short stubby wires straight to the back of the Just Cause basic power distribution board. This would allow both to be in optimal orientations and still take up very little space inside the bot. I'm happy to announce that Just Cause Robotics has its first ever channel sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is a trusted name in manufacturing high quality PCBs and assembly services at their facilities in Shenzhen, China. You can get 10 PCBs up to 100mm by 100mm as low as $5, and on top of that, right now all new PCBWay customers get $5 off, making the boards effectively free plus shipping. But that's not all. For bot builders like us, we can make use of their 3D printing, CNC machining, and sheet metal fabrication services. They'll machine S7 tool steel, 4130 alloy steel, aluminum 7075, 6061, and much, much more. Check them out at the link in the description. Everything I'm about to do is basically horrible, but we're just gonna pretend that it's fine. And definitely nobody is going to yell at me 
in the comments for my soldering techniques because they are perfect. switch kind of screwed with one screw and a nut onto this piece here with a hole drilled through the side so I can access the switch. I didn't get this one lined up properly so it's not in but could in theory when I print the thing do it correctly. This board is kind of secured with just the wires to the switch and then I still haven't figured out exactly where these ESCs need to live or change the wire lengths because that would have taken too long but the receiver can still live over here and power wires are running to it from the basic board. And I shortened the battery wire extension drastically. Testing time. Now that both the drive and electrical systems were already sorted out, I ran the bot through its paces. I showed earlier in some tests shoving around my dry box which weighed over 13 pounds. I added some 3D printed skids to the front forks to avoid them catching on my vinyl flooring and drove the bot around for several entire batteries worth of time. I also decided to shoot some slow-mo footage of the drive and weapon spinning for the hell of it. I wanted to get a sense for the power draw of the drive and weapon to know if it would be a bad idea to leave the weapon running for a whole match, so I hooked a current meter up and filmed that too. The drive draws way more than this under load, but wheels up it only drew about 3 amps continuously. The weapon similarly was drawing around 4.2 amps free spinning, but under cutting loads it will probably be reaching above the 20 amps that we see it peaking at upon spin up. Closing remarks. So, clearly progress is being made on shrapnel mine again, and I think I might be on track to have it ready by mid-November. If you have any questions about the bot, or recommendations on packaging the ESCs, let me know in the comments. My next video will probably cover another topic, but I'll keep working and documenting my progress on this in the background. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to all my viewers and subscribers for helping me reach yet another huge milestone. 3,000 subscribers! I sent out a poll last week asking what videos you all want to see, and this was the most requested one. I plan to make all three of the other videos people voted on though, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to know when those are posted. That's all I've got for today. Thanks for watching.